here's the simple truth. Sooner or later, we'll all need to heal from something. When this time comes, where will we turn? Who or what will help us heal? I'd been lucky enough to never give this question much thought. Then, my father fell unexpectedly and suffered a traumatic brain injury. For six long months, he was in need of healing. And after he passed away, I was in need of healing too. The experience made me realize how little I knew about something so fundamentally important. It made me want to learn more about how people heal. I've been a photographer my entire life and a filmmaker for the past decade. It's how I make sense of the world. So I set out to interview and photograph a wide range of ordinary people who'd managed to heal in the face of extraordinary adversity. The word healing comes from the old English root healin, which means to make whole. The word health shares a similar root. Here's the simplest way to think about healing. Health is when we're whole. Healing is the work of making ourselves whole again. Things like accidents and illness rob us of this wholeness. Brian Joas understands this well. One minute he was out for his morning bike ride. The next minute he was hit from behind and spent 90 days in the hospital recovering from a broken back, hip, and ribs. I'm embarrassed to say now that when I first met Brian, my mind, my questions went straight to the why. Why did this happen? Who hit you? Did they catch him? Were they drunk? This is what Brian had to say. You know, finding out who hit me uh, doesn't help me heal any faster than I, I am. Um, so I haven't spent any time giving it much thought. Brian taught me my first lesson that you can't always control what happens to you, but you can always choose how you react to it. Ashley Gleitz, a 24-year-old who was just diagnosed with breast cancer, understood this lesson well. My dad would always say that your life and its surroundings are a direct reflection of your own attitude. And I knew that once I was diagnosed, I couldn't change that diagnosis but I could change my attitude. It's a really simple thing to understand, but it's actually a really hard thing to do. A lot of people never get past this first hurdle after something bad happens, and they get stuck in anger, in cycles of anger or regret. I don't blame them. Life can be really hard at times because there are gonna be seasons of your life that suck. There are gonna be things that happen, people that die, people that are taken from you. And it doesn't make sense. And sometimes it, you ask the question, you for sure ask the question, why? Why does this happen to this person? But I just know that there is, there's hope. There's hope, there's a different hope. And why not, why not trust in something? Why, why not believe in something that can give you that peace and that joy? and that comfort. Rachel was Ashley's best friend and there by her side on her entire journey. She also grew up a preacher's daughter, which I think made her uniquely qualified to have things to say about healing. Rachel taught me my second lesson, that when bad things happen, you need to find other things that bring you comfort and hope and peace and you need to use those things as catalysts for your own healing. I watched different people do this in their own beautiful ways everywhere I went. For golf war vet Tom O'Reilly, it meant waking up every day, drawing cancer on a piece of paper, taking it to his garage and blasting it to pieces with his airsoft gun as he mumbled under his breath, you ain't got me, man, I got you. That was Tomo's way of dealing with the rare melanoma that took his eye. Citeria Knight, a social worker recovering from a stroke, had a different approach. She chose to love and be loved by her dog, Halo. Citeria told me that she's just so cute 
and furry, and she's always there for me being so chill, and without her, I don't know how far along on my recovery I'd be. Firefighter and Gulf War vet Juan Martinez chose a tried and true approach. He leaned into his deep faith in God. Juan told me he knew he was fixing to get into a fight when his son was diagnosed with cancer, but he had no doubt he'd be able to get through it with God by his side. Tanya Bailey chose a more secular approach, backyard chicken therapy. It might sound odd, but after she was diagnosed with breast cancer, she would have to get chemo. And this is how she described what chickens did for her. I'd come back from my chemo and I'd go out into the backyard and they all have personalities and they're so happy to see me. And for that moment, I'm not thinking about what's going on with me. Mary Shea Mondeshar lost her 35-year-old husband, Spiro Pina, to brain cancer. Afterwards, she changed careers and became an oncology nurse. She told me that being able to provide care for others in the same situation Spiro and she were in was part of her own healing process. Kevin Abinson was into trucks and wide open country back roads he knew like the back of his hand. While recovering from attempted suicide, Kevin's family taped a picture of his beloved Chevy Silverado to the foot of his hospital bed. Knowing he would one day climb back into it kept him going on his recovery. Every time I'd start to get down, he told me, I'd just look at that truck and remember, that's waiting for me. That's going to be there for me. That's going to be how I get through this. Levette Russell, a non-smoker in need of a lung transplant, doesn't believe sick people should have to look sick. That's just not the way I roll, she told me. I like to walk out the door looking so much better on the outside than I actually feel on the inside. She went on to say that she had no shame in her game wearing six-inch heels with her cannula in. As if that was not enough, she winked while encouraging people to just go out and celebrate and buy some new shoes. When Doug O'Donnell's son David was born with cancer in both eyes, he knew he and his wife would need all the help they could get from family and friends. Find people that you can walk through this with, Doug told me. You weren't meant to carry this burden alone. You weren't meant to do this on your own. Sana Mering scaled this advice. After her close friends, Joanne Hardiger and Darren Swanson, pictured here, lost their baby daughter, Bridget, Sana founded the nonprofit website, CaringBridge, to help people in a medical journey connect with their loved ones. 22 years later, one in nine Americans have used CaringBridge, and baby Bridget's memory lives on. You see the pattern here. It doesn't matter if it's God or therapy chickens or a pair of six inch high shoes. What matters is that you find something that brings you comfort and joy and hope and you use that as a catalyst for your own healing. There's something else though. These pictures are inspirational. The stories are inspirational. They represent high points. But all of these people went through periods of deep pain and sadness to get where they are. It turns out that pain is an important part of the healing process. Mary Jo Kreitzer is a PhD and RN who founded the Center for Spirituality and Healing at the University of Minnesota. She's devoted her entire life to understanding how healing works. You can't reduce healing to a simple formula. And so, you know, healing is a slow process, you know, that happens, you know, over time. Um, it can't be rushed. And what works for one person may not work for another person. I often talk about that it's impossible to get, uh, I think, to the other side of sometimes deep grief, loss, without actually going through it. It's not something we can short circuit and find a fast path around. So sometimes it's really dealing with the deep sadness, the deep loss that's so important to get to another place. Bud Hart understands this lesson well. His son Mike suffered a yet to be diagnosed autoimmune disease that left him with a stroke-like disability. He's made a remarkable recovery thanks to an ironclad family and devotion to CrossFit. 
But Bud, like countless caregivers, has moved through the healing process with his son and understands how pain has been a part of it. There's a line that somebody thought of one time. It said, pain is the touchstone of all growth. So nobody prays for pain, but everybody prays to grow. Well, well, what happens when you're going through stuff that's painful is you're growing. If you said to me, uh, would you want this to happen again so you could go through it again? I'd say, hell no, are you crazy? Uh, but nonetheless, you do, you do recognize that out of, out of really bad stuff comes a lot of good stuff. Bud taught me my third lesson, that pain is part of the process, but that despite it, you can still get to a place where sometimes you're even stronger and better off for what you went through. I heard this again and again. It was the very, a variation was, I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy, but having been through it, I'm so much stronger in the end. Sean Carter embodied this and so much more. I'd like, you to, I'd like to introduce you to him. Can I say the situation I put myself in sucks? Without a doubt it has, and does. When I was 22, I was invincible. Until we crashed into a tree where I was sitting. I lost everything about who I was. Sometimes life just happens, and there's no way to go back in time to change what happened. All you can do is move forward. It took 10 years to get rid of my wheelchair and start walking with my walker. I get down at times, but it's only for a moment. I know I'm still improving. I'm just so grateful to always have the motivation to keep pressing forward. I sign every email I write with, I will talk, I will walk again. Because I will. My one piece of advice is to never give up. If you think you will be able to accomplish anything, don't allow anyone to kill your dream. You, yourself, have the final say. Sean taught me my fourth lesson, that healing is possible, and that even though you might not be exactly where you were before, you can still get to a place that's different and good. I think we miss this sometimes because we confuse curing for healing. When you look at it this way, you can see that Sean might not be cured, but he's definitely healed. Before I set out on this journey, I'd never thought much about any of this. Two years and 38 interviews later, I've barely scratched the surface of what there is to know about healing. That said, I'm in a much better position now to heal and to help people I love who are in need of healing because I've learned these things. You can't always choose what happens to you, but you can always choose how you react to it. You need to find things that bring you peace and comfort and use them as catalysts to heal. There are no shortcuts around the pain, but healing is possible. And while you won't be exactly where you were, you can still get to a place that's good. When I started this project, I was worried that spending time with people who'd had so many bad things happen to them would be depressing. It wasn't. These people single-handedly reaffirmed my faith, not only in our boundless capacity for hope, but in our ability to heal from almost anything. Maybe that, in the end, is the ultimate lesson. That when our time comes and the inevitable happens and we need to heal, that we move toward it, not out of fear, but with our eyes and our hearts wide open.